I'm Christina Love, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from IV heroin use and other mind-altering substances. And um, I just want to thank say thank you so much, Governor Walker and Dr. Jay Butler, and um, and and for this incredible team. It is it's such an honor to 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 literally stand on the shoulders of giants and and be a part of this movement. And I just um, the the reason why I'm here and the reason why I'm able to speak is because there were people in my life that that thought that I mattered. They believed that I was a life that worth worth saving. And um, and I just I just it's absolutely incredible that um, that I can stand up here today and be a testimony um, to the power of recovery. God is so good, so so good. I spent many many years um, trying to end my own life, many many times overdosing and and being turned away from emergency care and and crisis intervention and kicked out of treatment centers. And along the way, there were helpers, um, people that believed into me and and spoke truth into me and and helped me find my way and and treated me holistically, you know, and, and told me, I, w- I really want to thank um, Paul Finch, who is an incredible physician's assistant um, who helped me detox for the very last time in Fairbanks, Alaska. And, and he, I mean, he told me, um, he first started to educate me on, on how this wasn't a moral disorder, how this really was a health crisis, you know, and that I wasn't a bad person, that I, I just made poor decisions, you know, and really started um, to, to elevate the things that I, I had gone through. I, I also want to thank um, all of the other helpers along the way. Um, um, Rachel Brown at the Aware Shelter, um, who who brought me in when I was I was right out of jail, and I told her my story that I was just coming out of treatment, and and the things that that I had been through, you know, that um, that the trauma that I survived as a child was the causation and correlation to my substance use, and that um, and that the discrimination that I had gone through while in use was not okay, and so it's just such an honor to be able to stand here today and and say we do recover, and that every life matters, and um, and sending this message message out to every person um, sending this message out to the state of Alaska just just says that that we believe that as a whole that every life matters no matter what thank you thank you Christina you know as as Dr. Butler said um, there's no one silver lever to pull that that, uh, takes care of this it's a it's a journey to to uh, uh, to recovery, and and there's been lots of things that that have that are being done that have been done. We're just adding some more additional emphasis to it, uh, raising its its uh, priority and awareness and the actions we're going to take. With that, I'd be happy to uh, to answer questions. Austin, Governor uh, Austin Baird from KTUU. Uh, in, in addition to this step, which seems mainly like a way of treating symptoms instead of going after the root cause, why not find a way to go after doctors who are over-prescribing opioid painkillers, which is one of the main causes behind this crisis, and also to go after pharmaceutical companies that are profiting from the death and the pain that you mentioned at the beginning of this press conference? That That is part of the part of the plan, and, and as we talked about during the, the state of the state, as far as having uh, more accountability for those that are, that are issuing uh, issuing that. I, I recently saw a publication put out by the president of the Alaska Dental Society about what they're doing on the opioid issue. So we are reaching out to the medical community because uh, they are they are literally on on, on the front run, front lines and making sure that the databases etc. are such that that if someone is over prescribing, we know about it and it becomes a so so that is a that's a, a key a key piece of it. So there's no question about that. So this. Uh, Liz Rains with KTVA. In your State of the State speech, you outlined sort of a five-point plan for combating the opioid epidemic in Alaska. Um, was that plan based on any research? Is there any inspiration from other states? It was. I do look at what other states have done. I have looked, certainly I've initially looked at what uh, Governor Charlie Baker in Massachusetts uh, has done. He sort of was, was a bit of the lead. Uh, and I, I had breakfast with him in, uh, in Washington a few weeks ago when I was there and talked to him about what they're doing in Massachusetts. Uh, Governor uh, Ducey in Arizona, the same, during his state of the state, he talked a lot about it. He put out an admi- uh, administrative order associated with it, this issue as well. So we are looking at what other states are doing, and uh, as we should, because it's not unique to Alaska. Our numbers are, I think our numbers are, are the worst uh, out there, but so we, we are looking at what others, what we have done research, we can continue to do that because when we get together around this table every week, it's not about what we're doing now, it's what what else can we do? Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're continuing that continuing that process. Becky? Becky Bohr at the Associated Press. Governor, you mentioned um, that it will take um, legislation. Do you anticipate a, uh, introducing a piece of legislation or a package and what would that look like well there's some legislation that's already been uh, introduced that maybe that can be amended to uh, to use vehicles that are already there it's not about um, 
uh, who gets to start first or who gets to get, how, how do we get it across the finish line as quickly as possible. So we'll look and make sure that if there's vehicles that are currently under underway that they that we can perhaps uh, uh, maybe add to or suggest to the sponsors to add to. So this session you'll see legislation associated with this issue. There already is legislation out there this session. So we're looking to add some of these on or introduce our own. Either, either way, it makes no difference to me. Add some of the pieces that you mentioned from the state of the state or what specifically are you going to propose? Well, um, some of the pieces I talked about the, uh, from the state of the state, um, not everything I've said can be done without legislation uh, in place. And so that's what we will do is implement legislation or work with those that have current legislation that perhaps would be acceptable to have an amendment to be able to accomplish. There's a few other things since the state of the state that we've come up with that uh, uh, we'd like to implement as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing, ongoing process. Andrew? Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, when people receive naloxone, are the the correct procedures in place for people to go to the ER and then get start to receive treatment immediately, or does more work still need to be done in that area? I, I will defer to the okay. good doctor here. Yeah, thank you for that question. So the uh, instructions that go along with the kit are really threefold, uh, including assessment to determine whether or not it looks like there's uh, an overdose situation, which oftentimes is expressed as basically breathing has slowed greatly or stopped altogether. Uh, administer the naloxone. It's an easy nasal spray. Uh, it's like using a decongestant when you have a, a cold. It requires no drawing up into a syringe. There's uh, no mechanics to, to have to fiddle with. It's absorbed uh, through the, the nasal mucosa and gets into the bloodstream very quickly. The next steps, though, are to call 911 right away because the effect, well, first of all, you may not, it may not always be an opioid overdose. Uh, it is kind of like CPR. When you administer it, you don't always know what's the cause of the problem. Uh, so ideally, everyone is going to get to definitive medical care. Uh, and then the third part is just placing the person once they're breathing into a position that's uh, appropriate uh, during recovery uh, while you wait for help to arrive. And how about uh, like the transition to, uh, to drug treatment, to, to addiction treatment? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because, again, this doesn't really address that issue. What it does is it saves a life so that someone uh, can hopefully enter into recovery. That's not going to happen every time. I'm not going to lie to you. There are certainly instances where people have received multiple doses of, of Narcan and have uh, relapsed, but ultimately you're never going to get into recovery if you die. So it is a life-saving measure. Um, the next part of the issue, as the governor mentioned, is addressing then access to treatment and increasing the number of places where people can go to have withdrawal uh, symptoms managed and ultimately get into long-term care to maintain recovery. Uh, I know also as well we touched on the perhaps the, the biggest issue is how do we address the need to self-medicate as well as the supply of, of drugs and substances in the community to be able to reduce overall the rates of addiction, not just saving lives, not just treating addiction, but prevention. So we have to get the question on the phone. Thank you. <clears throat> Operator, how many calls in the queue? Ladies and gentlemen on the phone, if you'd like to register a question, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the one followed by the three. <coughs> if you use the ticking phone, please lift your handset before entering your request. One moment, please, for the first question, which comes to the line of Matt Buxton with uh, News Minor. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Governor. Matt Buxton from the News Minor here. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, we're talking about increased treatment and stuff like that. Uh, what's the, the, the possibility of additional funding and resources being put towards this, especially considering um, the budget situation and the legislature's kind of hesitance to really get on board with a lot of any new spending right now? Um, how do you see uh, expanding this within the realms of the budget realities right now? 
Well, Matt, the reason I, I mentioned about the federal on the on the grants to go after every federal dollar we can, that is a, a bit reflective of sort of where we are uh, financially. But this is not something that, uh, you know, when, when we have a, a forest fire or we have a fire or we have an earthquake or whatever, we, we go out and, and, uh, and address that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and don't see if we can fit it within our budget. And, and so that's not what we're doing uh, in this situation. I mean, additional funding always is, is, uh, is, is a plus. There's no question about it. That doesn't mean we can't go out and do all we can with what we have today. And so that's, that's how we're addressing it. And, and uh, um, we're mindful of our fiscal situation, but that, that doesn't slow us down. Thanks, Matt. Operator, next question, please. Oh, oh, oh. <clears throat> This question comes from Anna, Anna Rose from uh, MacArthur. Uh, sorry, Anna Rose MacArthur from KYUK. Please go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, so when will the naloxone be start being distributed, and will it be available for IHS-funded hospitals? Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Jay Butler again. Uh, now, naloxone is actually available by prescription now. So particularly through tribal facilities, oftentimes providers uh, have that ability to provide the drug now. Uh, so, but at the same time in our smaller uh, villages as well, there's opportunities for organizations to become a Project HOPE uh, member as well. I should emphasize that Project HOPE is really aiming for organizations that don't have medical staff mm -hmm. uh, rather than the, the hospitals and uh, the tribal health system. Okay. We have time for two more questions. So, um, you're talking about the phone still? The phone. Okay. Operator, any more calls in the queue? Uh, there are no more questions on the phone at this time, but ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, to register for a question, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone keypad. Okay. Steve, did you have a question I skipped over you last time? Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about um, have you been in touch with any of the medical community or the pharmaceutical communities about your concerns? We, uh, not, uh, not the pharmaceutical communities that I'm aware of, maybe Dr. Butler is, uh, has. Um, thank you, Governor. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in the public health world, not just in Alaska, but uh, in terms of working with providers, uh, certainly trying to make the rounds to meet with medical staff around the state. I think a lot of providers are sort of unsure what to do at this point. Uh, there's a lot of press that sort of points mm -hmm. fingers, and I think what we need to do is stop pointing fingers, stop wringing our hands, and really join together on this. A lot of providers want to know what they can do to address chronic pain. Uh, the recent uh, guidelines that came out from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention addressing chronic pain management go a long way, but there's still the issue of what do you do with the patient who really is dependent on opioids and how do you uh, sort of move them away from uh, problem use and potential misuse. Uh, in terms of working with uh, pharmaceutical companies, it's probably a, a good chance for me to say that we have uh, a been able to receive a donation of uh, drug disposal bags from Mallinckrodt uh, Pharmaceuticals. So uh, sort of a cold call uh, saying, uh, hi, I'm from a rural state where we, it's hard to have drug take back programs and uh, the company had already purchased a large number of those bags. So we were able to uh, receive a donation of 25,000 of those bags that contain uh, an activated charcoal uh, product in it that can be made into a slurry. They can deactivate up to about 40 to 45 pills, and then it can actually be just thrown away in the, the landfill. So uh, there have been some, some opportunities uh, for partnerships even. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Governor Austin, awesome. from K2U again. Do you, do you favor broader drug decriminalization to push people more into treatment rather than prison, particularly with opioids? Well, let me just say this, but I don't think we can arrest our way out of the situation that we're in right now. We, we, need, we need to have a number of, of tools available for, for, the, for this issue. There's no one particular one that's going to solve it all. So um, that's, a, that's an issue of, uh, more in line with the, certainly the uh, you know, Attorney General, Department of Law, and uh, you know, public, uh, the Department of Public Safety as far as you know, where that, what we're going to do on that, on that area. So I, don't, I just don't think that's the, the, um, the direction that we need to go. So. 
um, we need to look at, at how we get people on the path of recovery at this point, and, uh, and that's really our, our, our number one priority. So with that, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today, and, and uh, stay tuned for uh, additional uh, announcements and work on this. And again, I want to once again thank, uh, I see we have members of the legislature here today. It, it sort of shows their level of commitment to this issue, and we'll see, uh, uh, I, I, you'll see a very collaborative uh, effort, uh, uh, us working with the legislature on this, because this is, there is no, there's no sides on this. It's all, we're all on one side. So, my, absolutely. So, thank you very much.